Good morning, and welcome to one of our series of breakfast talks of the uh, Brooklyn Waterfront Research Center of uh, New York City College of Technology. And uh, once again, we're doing this virtually. Starting next academic year, we will be back in person and we will be able to offer breakfasts uh, during these breakfast talks. Uh, today, we have to DIY, do it yourself, bring your own coffee and um, and bagel or whatever it is you have. At any rate, um, the Brooklyn Waterfront has always inspired artists, uh, visual artists, uh, literary artists, poets, uh, and visual uh, the visual vis the vistas that are um, that the Brooklyn waterfront affords have changed over the centuries, but have always been and remained intriguing and uh, and inspirations to artists. Today we are uh, we are featuring a panel of four artists who all participated in a, an exhibition that uh, is still ongoing and its curator and our first speaker, Maddie Rosenberg, will be uh, telling you about in just a few moments. And this uh, exhibition uh, is the uh, display of work of artists who have been uh, inspired by the Brooklyn Waterfront, and at least uh, three of them are going to be telling us how uh, they have been inspired by this. And I'd like to introduce the first of our speakers, Maddie Rosenberg, the curator of the exhibition. And she's both a curator and an artist. Uh, her studio work uh, extends over a number of media, including oil painting, artist books, uh, printmaking, toy theater, animation, as well as the installations. Uh, her work has been appeared in numerous solo and group exhibitions throughout the United States and Europe. And in 2009, she founded Central Booking, an interdisciplinary gallery focusing on her curatorial interests in artists' books and art and science. She received a national endowment for the arts grant for Dialogue, which was a six venue project in New York and Paris. Uh, her public uh, collections include MoMA, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, Brooklyn Museum, the Fog Museum, Yale University, uh, and she received a BFA from Cornell University and an MFA from Bard College. And so now, it is my privilege to um, to introduce Maddie Rosenberg to you. Hello, Richard. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming and thanks for inviting us uh, to present here. For those who don't know me, I have been curating uh, for many years, but I started out as an artist. And in 2009, as Richard said, I decided I needed to have my own space to present my own vision. And at this point, I've done more than 40 plus art and science exhibitions, but also um, uh, in, in itself, let alone all the book art ones and um, all different kinds of art exhibitions. But for me, Central Booking was more than just a place where I could do exhibitions, but create a full community, work with all kinds of disciplines, whether they were in the arts or outside of the arts, and really build upon that um, and, and push the idea of, of what an art exhibition is. When, when I decided um, that I no longer want, needed a space, because basically I had gotten as far as I could with handling a space and honestly doing all the admin that went along with that, um, I figured, I'd done what I could with the space, and now I wanted to actually spend more time focused on more uh, on specific projects and keep those projects into a place where I could really delve deeply into them. And often I use as a jumping off point what I, as an artist, prefer to 
to, um, to do. So I, I had done my first research exhibition with the New York um, Academy of Medicine, and that was very successful. So I decided to pursue that in a way that I could actually invite other artists that would do their research and have the luxury of working for months in an institution. And that's how this project began. Now, I'm going to be going through the many phases of on the water front of you from the coastline. The first phase was, again, was, um, was approaching the, the institution. And I had decided that it would be a great, uh, great match to work with the New York Historical Society um, and uh, to, to uh, create um, a collaboration with them using their amazing collection. And on the waterfront it itself came from the idea of uh, all the years, 30 years plus of me living by, this, by the actual New York Bay and uh, photographing, working within the community all the organizations that I love over here, whether they are arts or not, or other kind of cultural organizations, and to create a project around that and the ecosystems of this entire area, whether they're human or non-human. And uh, that was a very important, this is a very important uh, um, exhibition for me and project for me. As I say, the exhibition comes from the project. It's not just about the exhibition, but we are at the exhibition stage right now. Let me start from the beginning. And... Can everybody see? I do. There we go, okay. Oh, there we go. All right, so what the first step was to actually choose the artists that I wanted to work with. And again, this was from artists that I had worked with, artists that I had wanted to work with. And this project all started very pre-COVID. So we had no idea that in um, 2019 that we would still be working on it on 2023, but we've had the luxury of, um, of that long time to actually delve deeply into our research and in, into our projects. So then I approached the um, New York Historical Society and the director was very welcoming. We discussed the project. They gave us an amazing orientation with her and many of the uh, uh, curators there and that. All right, so here we are uh, researching at the amazing library. This was um, Susan Rostow and I had, um, were planning on doing our animations together and we were doing some research together. It was an amazing space. And this is Susan as well, photographing. So we had not only the library that we could do research in, but we also had their amazing archives of collections. And these were out in New Jersey. So unfortunately, because of COVID, our group of artists that were going to be working on um, uh, going together out there uh, dwindled. And it was um, just Judith and me who were able to make this during um, when things just started to reopen in uh, after COVID. And this is us photographing. You can see the curator there with her um, gloves. We weren't allowed to touch the um, objects or anything, but she would, she would do it for us and we were allowed to photograph as we went. And then we were also allowed to use part of the co collection that was at the museum, but in uh, the stored archives. And this is us um, photographing one of the drawings that actually wound up in uh, our pieces. The second phase then was to take this artwork and uh, to take all this research and to create artwork from it. And 
this was the first piece that I had done for this project, which was an artist book um, that was a pop-up book in terms of each one of the four pages would pop up into a vista of the area. And I had com combed through year, uh, years and years of photographing. I, my process was very much about picking three images to create a tableau, uh, creates a different color sense for each page. And from that then create the, um, the interior. So this is, these are the actual uh, first stage of the pages. Then we come to the actual exhibition install. Uh, very lucky to get these 8,000 square feet of space at BWAC in, uh, on, in the Brooklyn waterfront. It was very specific that I needed to find a space big enough for 14 installations for all of the artists to have space for them to grow and uh, expand and also that it would make sense with the project. And this was being a, um, a converted warehouse gallery was the perfect space for this. And luckily we, we were uh, allowed a entire month to do the install. This we have two of the artists, Graciela and Margaret installing. And then this is Paul who came from London to install um, and Okay, then the next stage is the opening. We finally uh, were able to be, we were all installed, opening the uh, gates. And I want to give you a brief introduction to the exhibition, a walk around as well, and a little focus on some of my work in it as well. This is, you can see from the uh, front of the exhibition there, that amazing look into the harbor and the um, uh, the sky. And this is the just the first room of the space. And in the center of it is Susan Rostow's installations and sculptures, and she will talk more about that, Sue. On one wall, uh, along the wall are my works, and along the other wall, wall is Desi Alvarez, uh, Desiree Alvarez. This is a close up on my work here. These were these six puzzle pieces that I created about the community where I inhabit and along the waterfront. And it's um, through the ages, basically it's um, contemporary um, Brooklyn at waterfront including the uh, community uh, organizations and protests and such, the development of the waterfront as the last, the first and last wor walking, working port of the area um, and a community where um, it is still functioning as a working port and, um, and the uh, residential aspect to it as well. You know, I got this idea of these puzzle pieces very much of kind of weaving in with two layers, the past and the present and different aspects of the community. So we use this, these, this idea of the puzzle pieces and this layering of the, instead of the palimpsets of, of layer upon layer, but just kind of taking each layer out and working with each layer of it. Um, and we, and we decided, Susan and I, that with um, our next uh, animation, that we would um, use this pretty much as the backdrop um, for the animations. And our animations uh, are, are very much organic, but we do start with my work and, and Susan's work. And somehow we, uh, when we meet, we find a way of um, creating a story within that. This is a close up again of the installation with uh, painting that I'd been working on for those three years of um, a multi panel painting, which I often do. And this is uh, with in the background of the painting. I had started off with a historical map of the area and then painted on top of it pieces 
of the area in various stages of use. And of course, um, one, create, uh, one piece there is the iconic Statue of Liberty. And you can see the, um, the book finished, the artist's book finished with all the pop-up pages. And this is a close-up of it so that you can see the interior of the pop-up pages as well. We get back to the exhibition and on the other side is Desiree Alvarez's installation, as I said, and she again will speak more uh, in depth about her own work. This is a view of the in entire first room from a different angle. And then we're going to go down that corridor and go to the end of the corridor and we will um, get to Sabra Booth's work. This was an installation that she did that was very much based on uh, the Gowanus Canal. In 2000, she first lived in, in New York. She's now in San Antonio, Texas. And she worked on a project of the Gowanus Canal. And she uh, went down there and sketched and um, got ill from all the fumes. And years later in the fall, this past fall, she again was um, down there sketching. And you can see there's a lot of her beautiful intimate sketches that she did at the time with the same reaction to the fumes. She also has part of her installation is an artist book that she made of um, the, the uh, pollution of the area. Then we go down the wall and we have Ellen um, Levy's work, which is uh, about the, um, the, the Hudson and um, the bricks uh, um, and all of the industry that was done there and through the layers and the land leasing through, through, the, through the different aspects of, uh, of um, the, um, um, the, the uh, growth and uh, industrialization of the area, including the brick making there. She does have an AR component of it as well that does uh, talk very much about um, the, uh, the, the brick making and the sludge. Behind her is, um, is Elena, um, Elena um, and um, Bariola. And she's an artist that works with her, her sewing machine uh, as an instrument. And she creates these wonderful artist books. She actually used for her brushes, a lot of the uh, fauna and flora of the area to paint in, and then she sewed them up together. This is Si Bang, she's on the other side of uh, the wall. And she, again, will discuss more about her work and um, you can see peeking through into the center space and the space on the right. They're getting closer up. This is Margaret, um, Margaret Craig's work and Margaret created an installation. There's a wonderful creature there, but that is actually also a creature that she uses for um, performance arts. And it's all, all of her work is made from repurposed plastic, which she has her own special uh, process for making um, uh, prints and such uh, using the uh, plastics um, that we are discarding. And here she has some artist books and lanterns that were uh, very much influenced by the Tiffany lamps at the museum. And then past her, we get into back to Paul Tecklenburg's work. And he was very much uh, looking at the waterfront and Buttermilk Channel. And you can see uh, along the wall there, one of his pieces was a cast of um, milk containers. And, um, and he installed them to create the tide that of uh, the channel that was right at the point of uh, when we opened the exhibition. He also did uh, photographs on, on uh, Ikea bought um, 
cutting boards. And on the other side, you can see as well, he has these wonderful uh, three-dimensional views of the area and another cement, cement installation as well. Then we get to um, Helena Coppola, and she is a Finnish artist living in Berlin at the moment. And she was doing this installation based on her mathematical background. She has a PhD in statistics, and she was tracing the, um, uh, the human genome back to our first common ancestor. And it's hard to see, but each one of those pages are basically a printout of this genetic code and the paintings are as well the uh, painted versions of that code and next to her is diane lavoy and she's an american artist living in berlin herself um, she created this installation this is her third version she was there for the first very first um uh, uh introduction to the museum uh, for the orientation and um, her first version of, of this piece, very much looking into the, um, the land of, me, of this area before humans even, um, even populated it, but just getting back to the, the, um, the pure, uh, the trees and the fauna and such. And she only uses, uh, materials, uh, fabric in her installations. This is the third version she uh, she tells me of uh, of it. She she basically after all these years of dealing of having COVID and the luxury of actually uh, having all that time to work on it, she pulled it apart, pulled it apart until she got a more abstracted version. And before behind it, you can see there are these very small lovely um uh, again they're, they're just these collages that are made out of fabric this is a close-up of the actual model that she made for this to scale and we thought that the, the model itself was was so wonderful that we could uh, install it as well now we're into the center of the exhibition and we have three sculptural projects that are um, start with an AR um, table here. That is a project by Patricia Olenek, um, where she has really looked at a 19th century gaming board, and she, uh, which was used for fortune telling. And for her, she's using it to fortune tell the future of the, uh, of the ecology of the area and what ha what will happen with um, with the uh, um, climate change. Oops. And here's a close up of uh, of Judith Hooper's work, where she has three ceramic pieces of different elevations and different viewpoints of the area as well. And behind her, you can see is Graciela Cassell's work, which is looks very much like a furniture installation, but is more in terms of um, uh, images of and a video of the uh, of nineteenth century views of of the area. And um, here we have. A close to view and an angle into um, Elena's work as well. Now, the last stage, of course, is to bring the work alive and the exhibition alive. And what we don't do with that is then we have the opening and this interaction with the work and the population of the of people here that are interacting with the installation of all of our work. Here you can see again, this is Patricia and she is showing with the iPad how that um, AR actually works. And then we 
have an intimate look at behind that huge installation of uh, um, of uh, Diane's that we have this intimate um, look into these small pieces. So I really hope to get all of you who are living in New York uh, or traveling to New York to see the exhibition before it closes on April 23rd. We also have events every weekend. As I say, we have a diverse community and, and we, have, um, we have artists that are talking. We had, we had our art and science panel, which we have for all of our exhibitions. We have a poetry uh, uh, ex um, readings that are coming up um, tomorrow that are curated by um, Desiree. And we, um, we, we really want to involve our, all aspects of our community. And for you to actually come experience firsthand, if you can, the exhibition. Of course, we will have everything up on websites and social media and such, but while we're here, we really want to encourage people to, to interact because community is very important to us and we are working very much with other, other organizations in the area as well to provide programming and cross program. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. That was a very um, comprehensive look at the exhibit, the, the space. You captured the space. You captured the work there. And uh, I encourage everyone to, uh, if they have not yet already visited the space, uh, to go there. And next, we are going to uh, have Susan Rostow uh, speak and also who exhibited uh, everybody who's speaking today has exhibited at that show. And she's an interdisciplinary artist who uses printmaking, sculpture, animation, and installation to create her work. She's a recipient of the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship and the Pollock Krasner Foundation Grant. Her uh, work has been exhibited throughout the United States, Europe, Peru, Korea, and Japan. Her work is in public and private collections, including the Alan Chasnoff Bookwork Collection, Yale University Art Gallery, and the Library of Congress. Uh, and so I would like now to introduce uh, Susan Rostow. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Richard, and thank you for inviting us to do this talk. And uh, thank you, Maddie. That was great to see such a uh, wide view of the, the gallery, even though I've been there so many times, it was really nice to see it um, digitally. <laughs> so um, I had the pleasure of uh, doing the research with Maddie, and uh, we looked at the same materials and it's wonderful to see how everyone interprets and how they were inspired to do it in their own um, style. So Maddie and I, were plan we planned on doing an animation and I do sculpture and she, do she does um, book arts and we incorporated our work together in stop motion animation. And I will start with showing you the animations and how we came about doing that. Okay, so the first thing I did, um, one thing uh, Maddie and I were both very interested in is maps. And we looked at the original maps from the development of the Brooklyn waterfront. And I was very intrigued by the, the symbols that they used to the marks and uh, the legends and how they represented the docks, the water, uh, the landscapes underneath the water the fields developed land, where they were gonna build the roads um, and how they followed the different Indian trails and uh, the various mark making in maps. So the first thing I did was I created, oh, hundreds of these tiny, these are like two to four inches. Um, the first thing I did was I created 
prints. I use linocuts and monotypes and collagraphs and uh, screen prints and made various prints. And then I created very small sculptures. And these were small because I wanted to use them for the animation. So I'm gonna show you. So uh, um, we took at Maddie's um, puzzle pieces and we incorporated, incorporated them with my sculptures and we did two animations. I'm gonna show you the first one we did, which was uh, like three years ago. This was the first one right before um, we started working on it before the pandemic. And then we actually finished it by the end of the pandemic or in the middle. <laughs> so I'm gonna show this. So the next, can you hear me? I was a little confused with that. Um, so the uh, next slide is how we uh, worked on the animation. Maddie had her images, her um, puzzle pieces and collages in the background. And we used my small sculptures to create the animation. And we were using an iPad with an animation app and uh, just slowly moving each piece until we got them to look like they were actually moving. And the next animation I'll be showing is the, the most recent piece we did. And this one's a brief history of Brooklyn and it has a little more of a serious mode to it.
So once we had the animation finished, um, I built a, uh, an installation and um, embedded the animation into the installation using a digital frame. And here's a video showing the installation with the frame. So this is the cast, and um, I deconstructed different doll houses and then reconstructed them in this. So basically, um, as I was working on them, I took pieces of the, the doll houses as well and created larger scale sculptures. And these are the pieces that are in the center of the room on the platforms. And oh, I think I can move this. You can see how I have the different, these are the windows. Um, and I built the creatures and had them sort of transforming into architecture and having art architecture transforming into the creatures. Like this right here has the uh, bay window that I took out of one of the doll houses. And this is a chimney up top. And you can still see the maps peeping through. Um, after doing all the really small pieces, I uh, took them and some of them became larger. I just kept working on them until they became about four feet tall. And some of the extra pieces of the doll houses became props for this, the larger sculptures on the floor. And the piece on the right here, this was an installation that had projections of another animation and um, that was projected and uh, onto the, the dollhouse and created shadows and um, various movements throughout the, the installation. And Parts of the installation included some digital images of um, animations that I did. And this one shows the map on the right, shows the map imagery and the animation um, sitting on top of it. And behind that is the structures that I took and made them in the same way as I would, whoops made them in the same way that I would my, create my sculptures, but incorporated them together with animation and um, the figurative work. And so I will be doing in part of the exhibition, I will be doing a stop motion animation collaboration on um, April 9th at, um, between one and 4 p.m. at Pioneer Works. So if anybody is interested in collaborating um, and you'll have 15 minutes to work with me and um, participate in an animation collaboration that will um, I'll take back to the studio. Everybody gets credit and it would be wonderful if anyone wanted to come just show up. You'll sign up at the uh, Pioneer Works and join in. So thank you. And I think that's the end. So stop share. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Now, um, I don't know if it was just my computer, but the sound was um, didn't come through on that was, was it a narration or were there various kinds of uh, sounds that were uh, part of the installation part of the project the the sound there were two sounds um there both videos had both animations had sound um the first one uh was by ruth antrich and um that did that was silent okay sorry um i don't know what happened um 
Well, that's, yeah, there's a, perhaps we can try when we uh, put this on our website, perhaps we can integrate the sound into, uh, into your presentation. We'll you were try able to, do to hear that. me though? You were able to we, hear me? Oh yeah, we were able to oh, hear so you. So I was talking speaking. during, but I didn't realize. Um, right, yeah, it was just the, uh, it was, you know, we saw at, that it said the uh, sound by, and so we yeah. didn't know. I didn't know if it was like a narration or um, it. Uh, there were different kinds of sounds, music or instrumental or something. So, so both so. both sounds didn't come through. Correct. Okay. Just, yeah. So. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I don't know. I just put it on. I thought if I was talking and you were hearing me, that my right. mic. Was yes. On, I don't yes. Know what there's one was. little thing. I guess. There's a button that has to be pressed. The next one, but we'll try to get okay. it into the yeah. um, because this is being recorded and it will be up on our uh, on mm -hmm. our website, and so uh, we'll try to integrate the sound when we put this up. And thank you very much. These are very interesting ways, and the way they evolve um, is just amazing to watch. So thank you very much. Thank you. Also, um, in the meantime, the, the both of those videos are on YouTube, on the Central Booking YouTube channel, and also my ah, channel. Um, okay. So in the meantime, until you get that together. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. And now our next speaker is going to be C. Banks. And um, she merges art and science in traditional and non-traditional mediums. Her work is included in public and private collections and books and journals. Public collections include MoMA and Brooklyn Museum, Artist Book Collections, Institute for Interstellar Studies, Custer Institute, the Library of Congress, NASA's MSFC, British Interplanetary Society, and New York City College of Technology, that's City Tech. And she has collaborated with actually a city tech professor emeritus, and she perhaps will tell us something about that as she explains uh, her work and what is on display at uh, this exhibition. So I am happy to uh, present uh, C. Bangs. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Maddie, for this extraordinary opportunity to exhibit. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, um, when I look at the New York harbors um, and the waterways in the New York harbors, I think of the, um, of the ships that have come and gone for many years, and the most beautiful and the fastest are the clipper ships. And their technical technological changes have changed us forever as the solar sail, which I include with the clipper ships, is doing to us now. The flying cloud. Um, the flying cloud was a clipper ship that set the world's sailing record for the fastest passage between New York and San Francisco of 89 days and eight hours. This ship held the record for over 130 years from 1854 to 1989. And that includes going around Cape Horn, which was um, very treacherous and continues to be very treacherous. The Flying Cloud's achievements was remarkable under any terms, but writes um, Daniel Shaw was most unusual because her navigator was a woman. Eleanor Cressy, who had been studying oceanic currents, weather phenomena, and astronomy since her girlhood in Marblehead, Massachusetts. She was one of the first navigators to exploit the insights of Matthew Fontaine Murray, most notably the course recommended in his sailing directions with her husband, ship captain, Josiah Perkins Cressy, and she logged many thousands of miles on the ocean. So now we're going to solar sails and clipper ships. Oh, the clipper ship is also a synonym for a merchant ship from the 19th century that plied, plied global routes and ferried cargo and passengers. What they would do is they would take from New York spices, flour, and dry goods to California 
to the gold rush there. From California, they would take gold and take that to China. And from China coming back, they would bring spices, silk, and tea. Here is its um, the record of the clipper ship. And part of, the, part of the reason that the clipper ships could move so quickly is that they, um, they were covered with large sailing masts. And that would be, they, they could catch very much more wind by those masts. And the masts and the sails um, actually have a correlation with the solar sail. And they could go, um, they, could, they could travel, they could travel 250 miles a day, whereas a normal ship could only go 150 miles a day. So this is one of the pieces um, that is on exhibition at, the, at the, um, the show in Red Hook. And it includes my correlation between the, the, the clipper ships, the solar sail, and the little, um, the little designs besides the solar sail uh, are studies submitted to NIAC for substrates on the solar sails that will make them quicker. Here's one of them. And here, here are two along with the solar sail in the lower right-hand corner. Five solar sails have successfully flown in space. The first, Ikaros, was launched in 2010 by the Japanese Space Agency and is still traveling between Earth and Venus. Others launched by NASA include, and the European Space Agency and the Planetary Society have since orbited the Earth. Here's a, a picture of the solar sail. Planetary Society's light sail one and two, um, Light Sail 1 was a crowd-funded experiment and demonstrates that a sail could be deployed in Earth orbit. Light Sail 2 demonstrated that a sail can be used to alter Earth orbit characteristics. So what is a solar sail? It is a sail that is a solar sail that is pushed through space by the pressure of light. It can be also called a light sail or a photon sail. Here's a Karos. and the accomplishments of Akaros and the Planetary Society's Light Sail 1 and 2. And here is Light Sail 2 above the Earth. Okay, current and future sail technology, they're two layered and a thin reflective layer is deposited on a plastic substrate. Near future all metallic sails are possible, including ones that could be made um, from molecule thick graphene. And another project that I have been doing includes um, how you could put holography onto a solar sail. And I did this, um, I, I write research this first at, at NASA in 2001 and continue to research it. So near-term solar sailing, um, this is a little out of date because it, today's sails could reach Mars after 400 days of flight, which is actually still the case. Future sails will do a lot better. Unlike other types of interplanetary propulsion, solar sails, of course, require no fuel. And this is the, this is the work that I'm doing with Greg, um, continue to do with Greg. If it's a uh, sail is thin enough and deployed close enough to the sun, it can travel to the nearest star in a thousand years. In 1981, Greg Matloff and Jean Mallow published a paper entitled Interstellar Solar Sails, the Clipper Ships of the Galaxy. But what is happening now with breakthrough propulsion that Greg is an advisor for, is that they're, they're, trying to, they're attempting to have solar sails travel to Alpha Centauri in 20 years, which is a great challenge, but um, we hope possible. So that is my presentation. I'm going to stop my share. And thank you again for the opportunity for, to present. Thank you very much. That's quite uh, interesting. So uh, have you uh, helped to construct these uh, sales or you're 
obviously you do artistic representations of them and uh, you capture the beauty of them, uh, but are you also uh, involved in the construction, fabrication of them? Not the construction of the sales, but what I have done and, and did research on and at NASA and continue to do research on with Breakthrough um, Starshot is to um, construct holograms that can be affixed to the sail. And the holograms can be used to, um, to help the sail uh, turn and be deployed in space. So the holograms can act um, essentially like, like the wind, the solar wind, or the, the wind in the sails of a clipper ship. So that, that's, that's my contribution, using the holograms on the, that will be eventually affixed to a solar sail. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, that was very um, interesting. So it just speeds up and uh, and doesn't use fuel. It uses light for the fuel for for the propulsion. That's correct. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. and, the, okay. and the and the holograms can make it go faster. Okay, so we might get to some of those uh, planets sooner than we uh, thought, just based on fuel. Based on based on the yeah on the on the holograms on the on the solar sails, correct? Right. Okay. Thank you very much. And Thanks. so now I'd like to uh, present our fourth and final speaker of the day, um, Desiree Alvarez is a New York-based painter and poet. Her work has received grants and awards from New York Foundation for the Arts, the American Academy of the Arts and Letters, Foundation for Contemporary Art. Her second book, Raft of Flame, published in 2020, received the Lake Merritt Poetry Prize from Omnidawn. And uh, I'm pleased to say she teaches at City Tech as well. She's been there for... Uh, quite a few years, uh, and she also teaches at Juilliard, where I believe she might be at this very moment, having had a class this morning. So um, welcome, Desiree, and uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for organizing this panel, and Maddie for organizing the entire exhibition. Um, it's been great to hear everyone's background research stories. I love how everyone came up with different different approaches to this project. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm here at Juilliard. I just finished a class. Um, that's why I have the um, composition chalkboard behind me. Um, hopefully we will not be interrupted by someone wanting to play the piano. Um, so I, I'm bringing us back down to earth after our interstellar uh, voyage. Um, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about all things oyster. Uh, this morning, I, I knew that I wanted to work on um, exploring the history of the old waterways of uh, New York for this project, partly because I, I live on top of um, Minetta Brook, and I was, um, I've always been sort of fascinated and appalled by the fact that the all these, these streams that were used daily by Native people to, you know, fish, um, have been paved over. So I wanted to learn more about that and look at the old maps. I thought that I would be doing um, a wood wood block project. And I, I had started making these these wood blocks um, with oysters. But then the the whole the whole the whole thing changed a bit. So I'm going to talk you through um, some of my research and show some images and share a screen and then maybe toward the end of it, I'll, I'll, I'll read the poem um, that is also part of the exhibit. So yeah, so I created a piece called Oyster Saloon, uh, which Maddie gave you a little preview of. Um, this is a detail. These are scrims of fabric. Um, So I looked at um, some early images, um, again, focusing on the native people and the the old waterways. I was looking at canoes. And then at the New York Historical Society, I came across uh, these 
these old wonderful images of the old oyster stands. And so I became really interested in um, this history of oystering uh, and thinking about that. Uh, these, are, these are by an Italian artist, Nicolino Calio. Uh, here's another one. So, you know, it's just so hard for us to remember that oysters were everywhere. I mean, everywhere, you know, that the shoals of oyster beds surrounding the whole island. And it was the main source of protein, particularly, well, certainly the main source of protein for the early people, the indigenous people living here. But even later on, it was a, um, a main source of protein. It was kind of like um, hot dogs, like that, like a hot dog stand. So um, that was my, my so th those were my early uh, research leanings. And then I got deeper and deeper into it. And I started, you know, looking at um, canoes and how the old canoes were made. Um, they were made generally of tulip wood and, and they were actually not carved out really. They were, um, they would, they would set a fire inside them. Uh, to burn them out in a more efficient way. And here's a here's a, a, a veal map showing the early, um, I think this is actually Minetta Brook and how it ran over toward an area by the Hudson River. Um, so I'm really interested in, in the genre of landscape painting. And I'm also really interested in how my work looks when it's situated outdoors in the landscape. And so this is an installation I did um, uh, with coyotes that I painted on the same scrims that I used for the, the current exhibition. Uh, and I think this is what led me toward looking at the Thomas Cole course of empire paintings that are in the collection of the New York Historical Society. Um, it's a series of very large paintings um, and they, they, they sort of chart, chart the, 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 the dawn to demise of civilization and it's sort of all told with the backdrop of the same mountain. Uh, and so I got to thinking about that, thinking about the way Cole uses light, you know, going from early pink through golden yellow to blue sky uh, to sunset. And so all of that um, plays a role in my own um, color thinking. And there's that mountain again. So um, the other part of my work is that I'm really interested in collaborating with communities. So this was a project I did on Governor's Island a few years ago uh, as part of the New York uh, Poetry Festival. I solicited um, words and phrases uh, from the public when we had about 9,000 people visiting that weekend. And so then I transferred their writings uh, to Scrims of Fabric on site um, and assembled them on lines um, as one giant public poem. So I, I wanted to do something related to that um, with this project. And what I came up with um, uh, was collaborating with the Billion Oyster Project, which if you don't know about it, is a really wonderful initiative restoring oysters um, to New York Harbor. And they collect them from all the restaurants. And then students at the New York Harbor School and volunteers um, anyone can volunteer, it's really fun, um, create these oyster beds. Um, and these are key to bringing back life. And of course, the whole point is that oysters uh, as bivalves um, are filtering the water. And so giving back, bringing back clarity to the water allows for all other life forms and the entire ecosystem that was once thriving in New York Harbor it allows it to begin coming back. Um, and they've been really successful um, at it. It's a really, really, really inspiring project. Um, and so I reached out to them. My godson actually goes to New York Harbor School, which is the school on Governor's Island that um, studies aqu aquaculture. Um, and 
Um, this is Roy Arezzo, the science teacher at New York Harbor School, uh, visiting our, our uh, exhibition. And um, so I visited Roy's class and of 10th graders, and I talked to them about my project, and I talked to them about what they're doing, and they wrote um, words describing their hopes for New York Harbor and the work that they're doing with aquaculture. Um, and then I transferred all of their writings to with ink to uh, the fabric scrim. So all of their writings in the installation um, are in blue and my writings are in sepia brown ink. This is a studio shot of me um, painting a canoe, uh, just so you can see a work in progress. So for example, this was one of my favorite writings from Marvin Matthias, a 10th grader. I hope to be able to see dolphins swimming and just be chilling. Um, I have many hopes and dreams for New York Harbor. However, one big dream I have is being able to restore the amount of biodiversity, Brian. Um, so I've layered them along with images of some of the wildlife in the harbor. Um, Finnegan Wasserman, I hope that one day we will be able to be in the harbor's waters without having to worry about the CSO, the combined sewer overflow, and for the harbor's biodiversity to increase and become a place sprawling and prospering, sprawling with prospering life. And then, uh, so my writings, uh, my, I wrote a poem, a long uh, poem called Oyster Saloon. Well, it's not that long. Um, and so this, I'm going to, I'll just read the poem and I'll try to scroll through the images for the rest of this. Oyster Saloon. Of course, empire, coursing river, tar stream, oysters like a clock ticking by the dock. I am thinking of what was lost. Of course, empire. In destruction, time is never destroyed. Waves wrapping rings around shells. Siputet little creek. I will paint rivulets in the painting of how it used to be. There will be brooks not yet paved. Lenape streams. Takana. I will draw giant oyster shells the size of butter dinner plates in buttermilk channel. Six foot lobsters. There will be dragons here. Again. I am not thinking of doom. I paint streams full of fish across Manhattan. I am looking at Thomas Cole's painted pink sky falling on teepees. Blush colonnades. Afternoon with empire. Then war with fire. Smoke on cloud, desolation, that clock hovers the river. Why does Cole paint faces on the canoes? Humans always putting their faces on things. The same mountain in every painting is a kind of landscape permanence and a road. There is always a road and a railroad, an underground railroad. Oysters like tree rings forever reaching out. Oh, little angel oysters, come back to the harbor. Thomas Downey, born free in Chincoteague in 1791, becomes an oysterman, saloon keeper, businessman, abolitionist. Thomas Downey runs a river of freedom at Five Broad Street in Manhattan. Look in the basement by the pickled oyster barrels. Freshet, tributaries, Black Shohanek, Lenape name for fork of river. Minetta Brook, haunting gush. Shh, I hear it under my bed when I sleep, sluicing the soft night below asphalt. I hear the ghostly oars plashing water, coral bells and sumac. Moon rising over column, canoe of tulip wood burning on the waterfront. I have to apologize for my, my 
poor pronunciation of the Lenape words for streams and brooks and tributaries. Um, I couldn't I couldn't look at my um, pronunciation guide on screen while I was reading. Um, but I wanted that language to be part of it. And I was really interested um, by the the many words that 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 they had for um, bodies of water um, ranging in size. It's it's it, it, it struck me as a um, possibly that there were possibly more words um, than we actually have in English, um, which would sort of make sense considering the fact that we've paved over so much of it. Um, but yeah, the story about the um, about uh, Thomas Downey is really really fascinating um, to read about, and that was one of the one of the last things I uncovered in my research. Um, little plug for the eco poetry reading tomorrow on site at the exhibition. We would love to see you, and it's an amazing lineup of really really wonderful poets writing about nature in many many wide ranging ways. So we would love for you to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Desiree. Um, that was poem was quite moving. Had us all kept and uh, what is apparent in um, in your poetry and in your art was the way in which your research informed your art. And I think uh, that's sort of what Maddie was. Um, you're aiming at. And I wonder if I might ask the rest of our panelists to uh, come on screen and unmute. And so I would like to begin with the question of asking you, I, I think, um, Desiree, I, could all, I already uh, can answer the question I'm going to ask you is, uh, how did your research, I know that there's the uh, you know the Thomas Cole paintings, the <laughs> learning the story of uh, Downey, where the uh, the Lenape Indians, how they made the canoes. So, uh, but I'd like to ask uh, uh, the rest: How did your research at the um, you know at the museum, which was part of this project that Maddie organized, how did that inform uh, the works that you? Uh, you did. And by the way, panelists, thank you very much for your presentations. And uh, I'm sure you've anybody who has not yet been to the space is now going to uh, be there. But so how did those, um, how did that research inform? Anybody? So just. Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> okay. Um... Well, for me personally, as I say, I like to create projects with things that I like to do. So I love uh, delving deep into um, into archives and such. So we, Susan and I both love uh, old maps and the mapping, and you can see a lot of um, the whole history of the area um, through the eyes of basically the colonizers uh, with uh, through the maps. So for us, maps were very important. I also love objects, um, looking at the artwork and the interpretations of that. Uh, we have some that date back to the Lenape and other indigenous um, peoples of the area. And um, we all the way to actually uh, present archives and uh, and journals and actually um, objects that were made by people who lived here through the centuries. So for me, it was um, because of COVID, we had three years uh, to work and um, Susan and I managed to go just to the library three times, uh, went to the museum and looked at their drawings and collections and and their objects. I tried to give a little bit of that overview of what I did as well. Uh, so, so there was a lot, and there was a lot of time that that was um, enriched. And each time I went, something else inspired something else. Now, not everything wound up in the actual work, but 
it did wind up in the thinking about the work and the background for the work as well. Okay, anybody else? Oh, I, I really enjoyed seeing the, the, the paintings and the, um, the posters of the clipper ships and doing a little research on, on the variety of clipper ships that would come into the New York Harbor. So that was, uh, that was my, my main focus at the New York Historical Society for that, for this project. Okay. Um, so, Susan, would your uh, well, the research? I, yeah, I think the the span of time really added to um, my inspiration because we went several times, and in the beginning, I was very interested in the maps and the symbols behind that. So I started working with that. And then as I um, went back and forth, um, my ideas started to grow. And I'm not a planner. I set to do a piece, but I don't have an idea of what I'm working on until it's finished. I just go with the flow. And um, the whole process of three years of looking and going back and forth, um, and not everything um, became art. <laughs> a lot of it was just sketching and ideas that led me to my final pieces. Uh, so it was just, you know, because it was three years and I probably wouldn't have focused on something so long. Uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic, it really kept us going. And for the final exhibition, it kept me really focused on following it through to its most. Okay, let me ask a, a question, a uh, sort of, uh, Maddie, did you expect that this was going to be a three-year project when you started, <laughs> or was it that the pandemic uh, had you alter the timeline? Well, yes, it's, as I say, it started in 2019. So that's, I think says it all. If the actual timeline was to have, um, uh, the orientation was in the fall of, tw uh, uh, and then the artists were able to do their research supposedly. And then the exhibition was supposed to be the following year in that uh, September, um, October period. So yes, it was a lot longer. And also the museum was closed for a lot of the period. So Susan and I and other um, others of us were very fortunate that we did a lot of our research uh, before the period of uh, lockdown. So we could be working on our art during that. But I had you know, artists that were coming from all over and they were gonna come that summer to do their research. Uh, and so they never got to do the research until later. So, so they had less of a period than we did. But once the, once the museum started opening up little by little, we had to you know, make appointments months in advance. We did uh, get those ad added later. So the first thing I know I did from my first research was the, was the artist books. But then for my second research came the puzzle pieces. And then, you know, we came from our third research, we had the, the second animation. So it was a whole process and development of work that uh, was a deeper, larger, stronger body of work that, um, that some of us were very fortunate to be able to have because of that period of lockdown. Whereas others, uh, it kind of shortened that period because they had to scramble once uh, once the uh, museum reopened to make their dates to actually do their re research. Okay, and now you explained, you and Susan explained how the two of you uh, interacted, but were there other interactions uh, among the artists so that uh, your work, your research informed each other or each other's art, each other's thoughts about the art, about the project? Uh, or did was there not that level of uh, of integration? Not, I mean, not really. Everybody was working 
in, individually, but on this, the same way, I was also communicating with everyone. So finding the process, a lot of artists with their original ideas, by the time they actually got to uh, their final stage of research, changed their ideas dramatically. Other artists, uh, as I say, just kept on layering and layering and laying on it. So I think what I was kind of the thread holding everyone together and constantly communicating with everybody and uh, and letting them the opportunity of knowing what, what who was doing what and, and sharing that information. And as I say, little by little things, um, things did when we, last fall was when everything was like, okay, this is the final uh, projects. This is, let me know what you're doing. And, um, and let me, you know, um, hear where you are with it and really pushing to that final uh, conclusion of what you want your, your installation to be. Now, everybody had an installation to do so they could do, put together however they saw different aspects of what they've been working on through the years as well. And some made one huge project and some, um, created bits and pieces of their projects and created it into one one project. Okay, now you have a um, you have a theme of the of the exhibition that is or the focus on the Brooklyn waterfront. Are there any other connections be among and between the artists? besides that geographical connection that the way the waterfront inspired is there uh anything about techniques or about themes or about um issues like that that connect all the artists who are part of this well it was interesting uh, when i actually got the statements from the artists about what their their final statements were and and part of that was what they wrote to me was so interesting. I decided to uh, to ask them to revamp them a bit for the catalog because I thought it was really interesting background to see what what they were thinking in terms of. But um, the whole point of the exhibition was to have, the, as all my exhibition is, I'm really looking to for various points of view, various techniques, various approaches. So. I wasn't looking for everybody to be doing the same thing. And even though Thomas Cole wound up in at least three uh, discussions of artists, you would never know from their work that they, they came from a completely different approaches by seeing the same work, how it inspired them by subject matter, uh, content, uh, uh, color, just impressions, you know, um, the, it was just, amazing to me to be reading that, okay, this is where all of these artists started from, and yet their work uh, was completely different. Okay, any, um, it's, we have like one minute left, but we could have a minute or two. Any closing comments, uh, Desiree? Yeah, I just wanted, you know, hearing Maddie speak about the length of time we had reminded me that, um, there was a fantastic exhibition at the New York Historical Society of Aristotle books, you know, really old, really old, a huge collection of books of um, Aristotle that I went to a couple times. And um, the influence that that had on me was that I wanted to do an installation with a lot of beautiful ha handwriting, like old script handwriting, because I was so knocked out by the, this exhibition and seeing these um early books and I was thinking what can I how can I generate all of this text and that actually was part of the trigger for the idea of um collaborating with the students um because that gave me a lot of writing that was outside of myself um and that was sort of a, had a more historic or it, of the moment history um for context by the way I taught uh high school for about 15 years and so when I saw that writing and I read about your project uh, it, I remember that in the way uh, kids that age can be and very open and very optimistic and it re you really capture uh, something with those uh, with those writings. So uh, uh, 
see banks do you uh have any closing words statements or observations of this whole project no just very much how i i really enjoyed being part of it and um and it continues to be in the back of my thoughts now with the clipper ships and the solar sails <laughs> so it's okay horrible. clipper ships i did not realize that they were so fast and for so long that uh are they still making any clipper ships? Uh, not that I know of, but you know. okay, I'm just and asking. Then, unfortunately, the Flying Cloud was burned, and uh, the fastest ship in the world was burned, which was, I think, a really uh, dreadful thing to happen. But okay, uh, Susan, any uh, final observations or? Uh, well. Just come see the show. I think it's wonderful okay. to see the variations of 14 artists looking at the same type of information, the same theme, and all expressing it in a different manner. Okay, and Maddie, uh, you're the organizer. We'll give you the last word. Well, I think you know, Desiree was the last word. That, that poem really put everything into perspective. Yes, yes but it was. It, it was quite wonderful. Um, but yes, I think that part of it is, even though there are these diverse views and such on the from all of these different wonderful artists, then I had to actually make it make sense with each other. So you're talking about the community, the community and the collaboration these artists are doing is basically now in the exhibition of they're having their conversations and each one of their installations are talking to each other. And that's why I went, I went through a run through of the space and a walk around it so that you would have an idea of how one flowed into the next, flowed into the next, even though each installation within itself is a complete body of work. Okay, um, so thank you. Yes, and I will encourage, again, I will encourage everyone uh, to go and see the show. I thank everyone who came here and keep alert. Uh, Actually, the BWRC conference on uh, our, our annual conference on uh, the 28th of April this year is uh, going to be on the hospitality. Right before the pandemic, uh, we had a, uh, a plan, the conference on hospitality industry along the Brooklyn waterfront, and we were going to treat it with all the explosion of hotels and restaurants and the like. And and we had to cancel, and we are coming back to that topic, but it's so different now. We're going to talk about the issues of, uh, you know, before, during, and after. How did restaurants stay alive? How they continue to stay alive? What are ghost kitchens anyway? And issues like that. So I invite you all to keep an eye out for that. And now, uh, so long to everyone. Thank you very much to our panelists, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye now. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.